see. Good evening, once again, welcome back. Um, we have just finished with a explosive, absolutely informative and packed, packed session with um, the handsome gentleman of Red for Africa, uh, the group uh, CEO and uh, the PR mogul, Mr. Adebola Williams. And there were so many nuggets that he shared, so many things that he has um, advised uh, for people, for us to be able to understand, to be able to push our brand, to be able to understand who we are and be able to hone our craft, hone our skills, be purposeful, be deliberate in the things that we do. Um, I will be sharing these nuggets on our platform, on the on our Talks with Titilayo page. And also you'll be seeing the IG live uh, session on the page as well for those of you who have missed out on it uh, there's so many things that you can get to learn from we're going to go into the next session right now and we're talking to an absolutely fantastic media executive uh, he's also into PR but he's big on digital um, in my research I found out that he was also uh, the brain behind two of the popular musicians uh, we're going to be sharing that and a lot more let me invite in Mr. Steve Baba Eko. Uh, give me a minute. Good evening, Mr. Baba Eko. <laughs> Good evening, ma'am. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. Um, yeah. It's such a pleasure to have you online. Um, here, I know here. that I have been talking with one of your execs, and uh, she's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've heard <laughs> so many, 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 many things about you. Some of our uh, audience have sent me messages to say, I would like to listen to Mr. Steve Babayeko. Uh, so so we're going to be unraveling who you are today. Hopefully, um, we can get a lot just like we did from Mr. Debola Williams. Uh, but, uh, Mama, I, I say it's pretty a little bit unfair though. You can't bring a handsome gentleman <laughs> like Mr. Williams and now bring me after. What do you want me to say? <laughs> I beg I beg to differ. I'm sure that no one thinks that you're the most handsome person on planet Earth. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Welcome. I appreciate it. You're yeah. welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. So Mr. Babayeko, um it's an exciting uh, period for me because I have a little bit of background in marketing communication and yeah. uh, you know how it is in that industry it's almost as if everybody just knows everybody even if you don't so know them you know it's actually a small um, community yeah that, I'm sorry I say it's a small community as big as it, it is, is yeah it is, it is. Yeah. and I see that you're beginning to push a lot in triple a n as well I'm well, going to be yeah, I mean, for you too. Thank you so much. I appreciate <laughs> it. And I saw one, I saw one of my egg bones. Uh, shout out to Sadele Momodu, uh, the yeah, Ogafana Kata Innovation. I'm 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 now. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining in, Egbo. It's great yeah. to have you on board. Uh, I don't want to get jitters when our orgas like that <laughs> come in. I'll try my best. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I can. So you're welcome. Let's just dive right into it. Um, yeah, okay. You are. Uh, you have your digital marketing executive. Uh, uh -huh. You have also delved into showbiz. You're promoting some key talents also in yeah. Lagos, Nigeria. I didn't know that until uh, I started. Oh, okay. I did my research yeah. on you. Wow, that is really awesome. So thank you. Three M ideas. Tell it's us actually about pronounced. What it's actually pronounced extreme. Oh, extreme. There yes, we go. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's it. Wow, yeah. how genius. <laughs> <laughs> so extreme. extreme ideas. What what yeah. is the inspiration behind extreme idea and what is the vision? What's the vision? Well, for me, I think the inspiration behind it is always like the marketing 
at first we we I've always done marketing communication. I started my career as a copywriter like in 1995, and I've dabbled into so many other things like. Uh, the entertainment industry where I've supported the likes of Simi and Praise who are now big or guy in their own rights and they've not, they are now going out to do their own things. But I've also doubled into, into agriculture as well. I own Babaiko Farms. Uh, but mm -hmm. the major thing I've done since 1995 to now is marketing communication is about advertising. Forget what they call it now, maybe digital or whatever. It's still the same thing. How do you yes. tell compelling human stories that will help you bond with consumers and help you in the same vein, sell products and services to them for them to be able to connect with. So uh, Extreme Ideas was started in 2012, uh, but now we are present in about three African countries, uh, in Lagos, in Johannesburg, and in Lusaka, in Zambia. So that, that's our story. We're eight years old. We're passionate about human development. We're passionate about giving back to the society. In all the almost eight years we've been in existence, Every year yes. we, we renovate a school and hand it back to Lagos State Government. So we, we, it's oh, always wow. just about people and about just developing human capital because look at about the 401 years that Africans have been in slavery, so to speak, and all the colonialism and the neo-colonialism that's happened. I think it's time for Africans to come together and stand up with our heads straight and say, we too, we have something to offer the world. So that's what Extreme is all about. I think we're going to. I think we're right on the on the on the on the track. We're, we're right on track uh, for Africa to boom. I'm quite uh, positive and optimistic um, about it. So, Extreme Ideas is an advertising agency. Now, yes, from the angle of from marketing communication, the edge that an agency has is that you're able to interrogate brands. Um, mm -hmm. You can have more than three, four, or five brands that you're interrogating mm -hmm. at the same time. And the edge that it gives you is that it's your 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 understanding is far reached, and Absolutely. you're able to um, um, have an edge, you know, even with those brands as well. Help mm -hmm. us to understand how you create. What gives you inspiration? What gives you um, the ability to provide the value for those brands? Well, to be honest, when I get this question a lot, I, you you're always under pressure. You have to create stuff. Is there no time that comes when you get a brief and you can't think of concepts to sell the brand? That what's your inspiration? And my, usually my ready answer is, I have a very beautiful wife and three lovely boys who are my sons. Those are my inspiration because they have to eat. So I cannot ask. I can't say. I can't say I have brain block or my teams have brain block. With it. So whatever happens, we must push ourselves to deliver. But on a serious note, though, I think it's just the genuine love for brands and the value they represent to our society. It's just, just imagine what it is like in this lockdown, when you are not able to interact with some of the brands that you really love on a day-to-day, -day, the way yeah. we, take, we take those interactions for granted. But now that we're locked down at home, now we begin to say, oh, this, people, this brand actually performs more value in my life than just the way I used to take them for granted. So I think it's that genuine love for brand. I wanted to connect brand with people. I grew up right. in Nigeria. I'm a Nigerian. I've grown up on the streets. I know what it means to be poor. I grew up really poor. So I understand what the streets, the language the streets is okay. saying. And, and, I know, and I know Red Media have been campaigning that anyway. So let me just borrow it for tonight. I, I understand okay. that, that, that street language. So I'm able to make that connection. Okay. Give us a little bit of insight as to how you started off. How Extreme Ideas was born. What's your antecedent? Okay. And, you know. Okay, before I even go on, please, I saw one of my, also the House of Representative member from my, from my constituency. All right, we thank okay. you, uh, Yusuf. Thank you, Yusuf. Shout out to uh, my distinguished you, uh, honorable. Shout out to you, sir. You're like, that right now. That's good. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, I started, I, I, I was born, my dad was, did a lot of things. You know, he was in the army. That means that uh, that meant that we lived in Uwuri for a bit, and then okay. he came back and retired from the army and came back to Kaba. So I lived in Kaba for a bit, but most of my uh, my teenage years I spent in Kaduna. So I'm a Kaduna boy. I was actually born in Kaduna. I grew up there, you know. And uh, I didn't even know about the existence of advertising as a maybe labor unit where you can actually earn a living until. I think three months to the expression of my youth service year, which I did with NTA Kano. So I, I did okay. my service in Kano. And then 
I always wanted to be a broadcaster. I wanted to be on TV until I got the opportunity to serve in Canada. Then I realized that people look flamboyant on TV, but after the news, they are looking for money to take Okada back home. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm not sure this is for me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm the first of six kids, and my five siblings and my mom are already waiting to get to. They are already sharing my money from the youth service anyway, so I, I, I didn't want to gamble. So until I stumbled on one interview by one of my guys in the industry talking about advertising, and that's it. I started doing research on my own. Then I think on June 8, 1995, I just packed my stuff from Kaduna in one bag hmm. and I came to Lagos, you know, hmm. and that's how it started. So I ended up, my first job as a copywriter was in 1995 with MC and Sachi and Sachi. Shout out to Baba Victor Johnson. He, he was the MD then. He gave yes. me my first shot and gave me my first job. And then after five years, I moved to Prima Ghana to Gilby, spent another five years. And then my boss then, Mr. Atumi, set up a one for one, deployed me there to be creative director in, 19, in 2005. And I was there for another seven years. And in 2008, I don't know what I was smoking. And then I decided to set up Extreme Ideas. You must, have, that, more, that... <laughs> you must have much boldness and confidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of boldness and confidence. Though, yeah. yeah, but yeah, yeah, we set up. Yeah, yeah. And we have a good story so far. Uh, haven't taken that step. I must let well, you, know, you know, all yeah. of those names, they, 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 they take me back into time. It makes mm. me that euphoria and that sense of um, uh, belonging at that time. I know one for one used to handle big pro, uh, the big brands like the British America Tobacco. Absolutely, and, yeah. You know, and Prima Ghani as well. If you remember you the know. proudly Nigerian campaign that British American Tobacco launched in 2003, I think I was the copywriter on that project and it, it was spoken about almost all over the country oh, at that time. Yeah. 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 Yes, it was. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so now we're talking, our, our topic today is sales. And yes. um, Debala Williams has given us quite a bit in the area of trying to find ourselves, understanding who we are, uh, bridging the gap between those who want value and what value uh, to give. Now, in from the angle of advertising, um, I know that once you get a brief, you want to understand what your client wants. So Absolutely. you get to study that brand, okay? Now, there's a process that we call profiling. Mm -hmm. I didn't raise that with um, Debola because I felt that, you know, in PR, it's usually more like a relationship sort of thing. Um, but for advertising, mm -hmm. but I do remember that he said, um, you need to understand your audience as well. Yeah. So that is their area of, you know, profiling. But in advertising, help us understand. Um, you want to sell ice to someone. You can't go to uh, uh, the, the, the ice, ice land, for instance, or, you know, I say you want to sell ice. Help mm -hmm. us understand what do we mean by profiling? How does it help with sales? Well, I mean, the thing is that target profiling is that for everything you have to sell, there must be ready markets, right? So it's yeah. like a hammer and an anvil. An anvil is that thing you use. Or do. So for you to be able to conveniently deliver or project the attributes of the brand or service you are trying to sell, there's, a, there's an audience who need, who need it. There's a brand who has the offerings to deliver to that audience. So some, most of the time for me, it's not so much as what the client wants. You see, because hmm. the, from the layman's point is, oh, okay, how do you sell what the client wants? Because, you see, the client and me, we are bystanders in this process of delivering value from a brand to a consumer. So if I, if I do what the client wants all the time, I might, I might do wrong by the brand we are trying to sell. Because there's, a, there's usually a marketing challenge between getting the value of the brand to the consumer. So you must profile mm -hmm. that target market that you are trying to deliver value to. So you understand them, understand consumer behavior, how they think, where they go to. Your brand must be able to interact. There's something they call the consumer footprint. Your, your brand must be able to interact with the consumers from the time he wakes up in the morning till the time he goes back at night. What are the convenience, low-hanging fruit opportunity to be able to sell 
to those people, and that's what profan is all about. I shout out to, to Aditola Magzago. I see that she's sleeping. She thinks I'm not going to see her, but I shout out to you, Tola. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're talking to our youth today, and we're saying that the arts and the skill of selling is so uh, diverse right now. And mm -hmm. it has become even more limited because of the prevailing situation that we have found ourselves. Sure. How are these young ones able to direct their market? How are they able to hone? What, what would you suggest for somebody who's been in the digital space and who also understands the mm -hmm. art of connecting? Mm -hmm. What would you suggest? Well, the thing is that is, the digital is that leveling ground that has like democratized the, even the art of selling. Before, if you wanted to sell something, you have to pay a landlord and get a shop. And then after that shop, you pay the rent for the shop and then buy your goods and put it in that shop. And then you have to buy this and better pass my neighbor generator and be part of your... So many wahala in trying to just do business. But now, with digital space, the, that whole level has been democratized and leveled up. So it means that if you have anything to sell, just the way me and you are talking now, before we even started to use all of these tools, it means that you have to invite me to a hall. I invite certain people. Now, yeah. and we can talk and the whole world can be listening to us. So and that's exactly what's happening right now. But it's just that it's not even so much as even the democratization now. It's there now is the how. Because if you sell the way we used to sell before, there are certain detergents when I was growing up. When you see their commercial, mm -hmm. they will tell you, oh, put a, a scoop of... Uh, so I'm not going to mention any name of any detergent. Put a scoop of that detergent in your hand put it into this basin, shake it together. No consumer today wants to listen to all of those long English because the consumer is facing too many issues in their lives. Economy, they are struggling with it. Now COVID-19 has added fire to the whatever it is that's burning before. Yes. So, it's so many things. We can't go out. We are socially disconnected with some of the people we love that we would like to interact with. So if you are going to sell now and you can't find a way to imbue some kind of level of entertainment into it, I can guarantee you, you are probably going to fail. Because the consumer yeah. is thinking of too many things. You, if you come hard sell and you are trying to speak English mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. talk down to the consumer, the consumer is already having their own consumer cons uh, conversation. They have their clicks that they are talking to. So you have to find a way to weave your brand into the consumer conversation and be part of it instead of doing hard sell today that, that's just the, the difference that right. uh, the season has brought into sales market okay so i have uh J jaye network who wants to ask a question so i'd like for yeah. you to type that question while i um ask the next question um i want you to take us through the journey uh of you being a juror uh with the new york uh advertising um, yes and also you were also part of the team for the Lurie Festival um, acting. Mm -hmm. Do you have a background in theater? Well, yeah, yeah. I studied uh, theater at the Amadibolo University. Shout out. Uh, mm -hmm. Up Abyssides, the, the, our slogan is, uh, and Abyssides is naturally ahead of you. So, yeah, uh, we're mm -hmm. really proud of, of my school. Uh, but, yeah, I studied <laughs> theater. At, but being, being a juro at all of those festivals has been very rewarding and also revealing. I mean, last year for me, I did a lot of work. I was also not just in New York Advertising Festival. I was a juror at the Cannes Lions Festival, which is like the biggest advertising award in the world. I was also a speaker at Cannes. I think for the first time in the 66 years of Cannes' existence, hmm. the first African panel to present on the main stage was the one Extreme Ideas uh, sponsored oh, wow. last year. I had Omotala with me. I had uh, my brother, hmm. Sukri Tofi from South Africa. I had Fadi Ogunro with me. And uh, yeah, so we had a good time. But I mean, the thing is that you are open to just meet world-class people and you just have to show the fact that Africa is here to represent. So I'm always proud to just fly the flag of Nigeria and represent my country. Yes. Yeah. 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 And shout out to my wife here today. She just joined as well. Welcome, yeah. Mr. Babayko. Thank you for joining in. And uh, thank you for giving us such an, delivering to us such an accomplished, fine man, just like <laughs> Kay Gennady had said. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, what, what, where do you draw the line? My question around that was, where do you draw the line between being real and managing realness? You know, sometimes as a juror, you just want to 
there are times you want to just be politically correct and mm -hmm. there are times you just want to you know be be real how do you how are you how are you able to plan or manage around those periods uh, you you have to you the truth is that you you the work as objectively as possible. There are, there are lots of creative works that have been entered from all over the world that requires you to, to produce, produce, to just do a verdict on. So you have no choice. You have to be real because if I submit my work for all those awards, I want a juror that will be also be objective and judge me based on the merit of the work. But what you also still find, as much as you want to be real, what I find globally with most of those international awards is that not too many black people are represented in the room when they are judging. So if I do a concept based on the Nigerian uh, cultural nuance, it will take a lot to explain it to some Caucasian who are the majority in the room to say, uh, this is the creative handle, this is the, this is the punchline in this, in this work. So that's what African work is still suffering. That's probably why we've not won any kind in Nigeria. But I assure you, as much as long as we have Nollywood and our music currently ruling the airwaves and ruling the world, we will get there. But I mean, when you are a juror, you just have to be real and objective. Okay. So one of the things that you sell, that you're selling to the world, is the Obangogo Hill Program. Yeah, Obangogo Hill. Yeah. More information. Help us to understand. Is it targeted towards the youth? Is it a youth empowerment program? What exactly is the vision? Of well, well, I'm from this... I'm from this beautiful town in Kogi State called Kaba. You know, that's where I hail from. I'm really, really, I love my town. I'm really proud of my town. So uh, I think about two, three years ago, the organizers, I, I wasn't even part of the original organizers. They, they came to me and they wanted us to project this mountain. It's a festival that includes mountain climbing. It's like one of the tallest mountains in, in that Kogi West area. You know, it's a wonderful experience. The young people come there. It's one day in that in every year that just binds all the young people together. So we just said, okay, look, this is like a small festival happening in Kaba, but how do we project it to the world? So I think about two, three years ago, I started working with the team to like handle the creatives and the public publicity around it too. Just our 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 goal is to make it like maybe a UNESCO site in the nearest future, okay. and we've been pushing and pushing and and trying to create all the awareness that we can. So if you are somebody who loves mountain climbing and you love culture, please join us this December in Kaba, in Kogi State for the Obagogo Festival. It's, so it's, it's, fun, it's a year you. program? Is that what it yes, is? It is. It is yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. How, do you, how do you recruit the people? How do you recruit the, the, your mountain climbers? We don't even recruit it. I mean, it's open for all. You see, they are like cultural sites. I mean, that is like a very historical site. When it's used war against our uh, against our people, it was one of those places that mm -hmm. we used to that, that we hear some of our forefathers used to. So you, it's where you can hit a stone and it will sound like a drum. So many interesting sites. So we don't really restrict. We don't choose. You can come in and join and part of the and be part of the festivities and just have a fun. That's what we do. Okay, so I have Jaya Network here asking, is there a way to do social media advertising different from advertising on traditional media? And what are the points to consider? I think you touched on that, but you know, they want to get well, a little I bit. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, that's, a very, that's a very interesting question. I mean, the thing is, communication is communication. You just have to talk to people. You have to build bond with people and connect with them. But it's just that sadly, we, sadly these days you just see everybody, it's, it's become like an all-commerce affairs to see somebody saying, I'm into advertising as well and I can advertise on social media. So, which is why we have, we've been begging the government to say, the APCON Council, which normally regulates advertising, so that people cannot make claims that are not true. You know what happens is that if I'm selling product A, and I try to sell it to Nigerians, and I, and I try to overclaim some of the properties that the, the product doesn't have, I'm claiming it. Maybe the product mm -hmm. even contains things that can harm our, our people. Yeah. 
if I go on the on the, in that digital space, space, I can make all of those spurious claims that nobody can challenge me. That's why it became a little controversial when people started saying, look, uh, Apcon wanted to regulate the digital space and the advertising. Yes, we understand. And what I did tell Apcon at that time was, for the market woman who wants to just sell their product that they are just managing and they want to sell it online, create a different yardstick for people who are selling products who can be harmful. Now you see people who sell products who they say can increase that they say can increase your libido. We don't know the property of those products that they are selling to our young people. We don't know that maybe people can begin to have maybe kidney failure from it in 10 years' time. But let them go through the process where those products will be vetted and be monitored effectively, which is why we still say at some point, uh, some level of regulation will be required, even though that kind of regulation should not then kill the business of people who are just trying to eke out a living of advertising on social media. But I, and one, that's one of the reasons why I'm actually running for the president of uh, the Association of Advertising Agencies of Nigeria, because I just feel that, look, I can sit down with all of the stakeholders and we, we sit down properly and marshal out how we're going to regulate that digital space so that people can make the claim that are true and genuine, so that the consumer cannot now uh, maybe fall victim of people just selling them a dummy. That's but if you, want to go through, if you want to go through the traditional space, you must go through vetting. They have to vet your work to make sure that the claim you are making is right, you know. That's basically the difference. I, I, I kind of, you know, tap, I want to tap into the, some of the things that you have said. Uh, yes, there has to be a framework of um, how people should be able to throw out their content and uh, materials online. But then again, you also want to consider that it's a market where there's easy, there's, there's free move um, and inroad and uh, free exit as well. So, mm -hmm. um, if you, if for a space like Nigeria, for instance, where it is that regulations are not, we don't have that much of a strong institution to ensure that regulations are properly abided. We can abide by these regulations. Um, what do you propose? I know that within the advertisement space or within uh, the communication, marketing communication space, at least there's some, some ambit of um, laws that people have to, that practitioners have to abide by. But yes. online, on social media, are you sure that that can be achieved? You know, you can, you can ex establish uh, regulations? It, it's it's going to be difficult, but the thing is to sit down with every major stakeholder. If, I don't think government should do it by fiat, where government just decrees and make a law that will affect people negatively. Let all the stakeholders come to the table. Let the yes. government show, demonstrate why we need to do it. We don't want you to go and buy a product from this guy and drink it and three, three years down the line, you discover that because you did not ask the right questions when you bought the product, you now have kidney failure as a result of consuming this yeah. product that nobody verified. So once you are able to demonstrate the reason to the people, I'm sure they will understand. Instead of doing yeah. a blanket law that will just, you, will just create all, all kinds of bottleneck for people who are generally trying to do good business and survive in this hard time. So I think it's about sitting at the table and getting the voice of voices of everybody heard, and then we can forge a way forward from there. Okay, fantastic. I hope that answers the question, uh, Mr. Jaya Network. If there's another question that anybody would like to ask, feel, please feel free uh, to throw that in. Okay, so um, because of your passion, I see that your passion you know, comes through. You work a lot with the young ones. I see that you have, you're one of those who push out, uh, just like Mr. Debola Williams as well. What empowerment programs or platforms do you have in encouraging expressions from this demographic? Well, I mean, a, a, a couple, because I mean, as I always say, you, you, can, you know, not one individual can save a nation, right? But may, there may be mm -hmm. just a role that one individual can 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 play that can push a nation forward, and that's what that's what how I've always seen myself to say, God put me in this country for a purpose, which is why I'm not American, I'm not German, which is why I love Nigeria so much, and I will, I will always live here no matter what happens, you know. Yeah. But so what we've done is to create small platforms that in my in my own little way I've been able to make contribution. I'll start with number one. For over 13 years now, I've been going to University of Ibadan. I mean, if you know how many people I know who are 
how are products of UI? You think you probably think I graduated from UI because every <laughs> year I go there as much as I can uh, to give lectures, to to do workshop, creativity workshop. Some of the people that I actually work that that I did the workshop with, like maybe twelve, thirteen years. Some of them are creative directors now in other agencies. Uh, some of them actually have now found their way into senior roles in extreme ideas. So I'm really, really happy about that. I, if I find any book that I find interesting, written by Nigerians that I find inspiring, I buy it in bulk and I send to some of those schools just to, um, just to show, I just inspire the young people to say, okay, look, there's a yeah. future in spite of all of the hardship we know we all face in this country. That's one. Number two, I spoke to you about the renovation of school school since we started mm -hmm. about seven years now. The only time we ever moved out of Lagos was when uh, the school that was burned down by Boko uh, in, in, in Bono State, uh, we, they had to go back to school, but the school had been burned down. So they moved the, the furniture. So they used school in the afternoon the original students of that school will, will go there in the morning. So what we did, we, we constructed about 371 uh, desks and chairs for those schools to just renovate that place. And every, ever since, we've been renovating schools, building libraries, and, uh, and just handing it over back to the... That's why, really, I, I hardly ever want Are to talk about... Are they schools in Lagos? Funny enough, I've never seen music as a business. I've always seen that... The, Sorry? Are the schools in Lagos? Sorry, Mama, I didn't get that. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? It caught up a bit. Yeah. I didn't hear it. Yeah, 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 yeah. All of the schools, are about, apart from one that was in Bono State. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are, in, they are in Lagos. They are all in Lagos, apart from one that we did in Bono State. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> I, um, for music, for me, music for me has always been just a platform to give back. So if I'm supporting an artist, a talented, extraordinarily talented artist like Praise, for instance, I mean, how we, are we going to live with ourselves in this country to see that an artist as talented as Praise, his career did not see the light of this. So I just feel it as a sense of responsibility to support his career and make sure he's grown to be the man who also owns his own label and doing fantastic work for himself. If it could be see me tomorrow, and then we've supported Simi for five years. She released two albums. Now she has her own label and she's hiring people. So we actually support these people to empower them to stay on their own. Uh, and that's why people always ask me, how come we never hear cases of this food between you and your artist? I'm like, for me, I'm not doing it for profit anyway. So for me, music is almost like not for profit, you know. Uh, we support them. And when it's time for them to leave, we, as difficult as passing, as leaving each other may be, we, we try and make it as amicable as possible. Yeah. Okay, so Mr. Babaiko, what you have done is just floss over that issue. Even though um, uh, you don't do it for profit, um, yeah. I'm sure that there are um, proper documentations that you both come into in form of, in form of an agreement. Okay? Absolutely, and yeah. It's also um, inform, in, it, 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 it's important that you are able to inform what role each party is supposed to play, you know, for an eventual success at the end yeah. of the day. So what role, what do you think in terms of their ownership, the artist ownership? Um, you know that what is happening is we're seeing things that are largely accredited to the signing artist who bears the burden because they want to protect themselves as well. So how do you do that? How do you help them to protect them and yet be able to uphold your brand in the process? Thank you. For, it's a very important question. Usually when you see wrangling between artists and, uh, and uh, their label, it's because the rules are not pro properly defined. Sometimes contracts are not signed. You don't advise the artist of their rights. They don't even have any understanding as they are leg the legal framework that all the contracts you've given them. And sometimes the artists are so desperate to sign a contract. They just want to, like they say in Nigeria, they just want to blow. So they don't even want to do any rigors of checking what they are signing. But, so that's why you always see this back and forth. We always make sure we keep all our dogs in a row where you, you have the contract, we give it to you, go and check it out. If there's any clause you don't like in there, bring it back. 
and we advise you properly. But at the end of the day, as a business owner who runs music, if you can avoid greed as much as possible, you'll be fine. Mm. It is when people now get greedy to say, okay, look, you know, you hear of label who will get a gig for an artist for four million and they tell the artist, oh, it's for charity. It's actually my friend. Go and perform free. So the artist is going to find out. And once those trusts is like Absolutely. rich and then there's no coming, coming back from it. You know, people are bitter. And then, so once you are transparent and you are honest about the relationship and then you try and build some kind of more, you overlay it with some kind of family bond, it makes it easier. Even when there are disagreements, you disagree like family. You are not disagreeing as adversaries, you know. Thank you so much, Mr. Babaiko. Yeah. This is another yeah. version that I've heard. I've mm. always heard the version of the artist being greedy. I've never gotten this much of an honest answer to say yeah. that, you know, it's also important that the label themselves have to take into consideration because these are young people who also feel that they have a limited period of time in the space. They want to be able to hold and harness as much as possible within the shortest yeah. time because they know that they have their faces and their periods as well. So it's really enlightening that you're coming out and you're taking responsibility uh, also for the role that the labels are supposed to play yeah. for this art. You, you have to because, I mean, until recently when you now find sons of, and children of billionaires playing in the music space, before, it's usually a space reserved for the children of the poor. Because if, yeah. if you are from a very good home and you say you want to be a musician 10 years ago, you, I'm sure your parents will slap you. But now, <laughs> so you imagine that children who are from, the, from that uh, bottom of the pyramid, their only ambition is for them to climb up and be successful so that they can pull up their own family. So if you do anything that makes, you, makes it look like you are standing between that, them and that dream, it's, it's going to be a tough it's relationship, I can, I can assure you here. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes. Okay, so um, like I said again, our company or our space, our country is one that is laced with a lot of people who are very fickle, we're very uh, fluke, we're quite erratic. Even as when you study consumer behavior, the sort of thing that goes for a space like South Africa or Namibia is totally different from the way Nigerians are. Mm -hmm. Having touched on brands in those areas, give us, uh, what do they call it now? A comparison. Give us a SWOT analysis of uh, the consumer behavior in these areas. Uh, well, I mean, some of those, the, is the pl what you find that's the common de denominator is the pl pl plurality of culture. Even in Nigeria, yeah. you're talking about over 250 ethnic groups, different languages. So you must now see, talk about the dichotomy between the Northern culture and the Southern culture. And if we now go to the South, you must now think about, oh, how is the Yoruba person different from the Igbo person? What connects? There are certain colors that the North will find even more interesting than you find in the South. It, from, even when it comes to like making products, if you make products that are sweet, the rule of thumb is that the Northerners prefer it slightly sweeter than the Southerners. So it, it's, it's that plurality of cultures that you must be able to address. And if you go to like Namibia, you, you know, they have the white uh, Namibians and they have black Namibians. Among the black Namibians, you start to break it down into different, uh, all the nuances that are based around culture and people. But having said all of that, there is a universal truth that applies to humanity. So that's what marketing communication experts are looking for. What is that singular universal, universally recognizable truth? We all get sad. We all get happy. We all have our fears. We have our dreams. We have our ambition. If you weave, weave your story around those common denominators that yes. apply to humanity, you'll still be able to connect with any consumer, no matter the disparity you find in the cultures. Well, fantastic. I yeah. hope that really helps out um, with a lot of people who want to be able to present and package their products. Um, hey, Damilade is asking a lot of people know you as an icon in advertisement. Are you still involved in music? Mm -hmm. Are there ways in which the two areas merge under your leadership? Well, to be honest, I, the music will always be part of me. It's just that we're pivoting at the label now. We, I, I just don't think music, the way it used to exist, the structure between setting up a label and signing an artist, 
I think I think that is a thing of the past. Believe me. Eventually, everybody will see it, uh, and with all of the people, uh, artists jumping their contracts, they don't want to serve out their contracts. And you know, Nigeria is a very interesting place. You may have even cut off your head and given it to an artist, right? If the artist decides to bail on you and not fulfill that contract, uh, their contractual obligation, all they need to do is to go on uh, on Instagram and Twitter Instagram. and cry. And once uh, two dead not picks it up and puts it up to say, ah, look at how they are suffering this artist. That is, that of... is the talk of law. Two dead not is the talk of law. There, right then, there. Then the whole country starts to drag you like I better pass by the body generator. So it's it is is that that space needs to be worked out. So I think where the trend is going now is for artists to own their own label and be able to support their own work. Because you see, yeah. the people who work hard for their money and put money down to back up music are beginning to realize that, especially as it exists in this country today, you probably yeah. never recoup your money back. And then yeah. you cannot force the contracts. It's going to be this almighty label versus this poor artist. Mm -hmm. So you, you mm -hmm. might win in the court of law, but you lose in the court of public opinion. So, so many things have happened that is making us we evaluate our own involvement with, with music. We will continue to do music, but we are, we are in the process of pivoting that uh, platform. And I've discovered agriculture now. I mean, in 2018, in Nigeria, my country, my dear country, we spent $500 million to import palm oil. I mean, please, that's how, that's how, that's how, that's how, that's how did we get here? So It's tragic. It's Tragic. It's, it's, it tragic. Tragic. <laughs> it's tragic. Yeah. So it's tragic. It's tragic, yeah. which is why we, we have a 50 hectare farm in Kabayankogi State now where, where we planted palm trees. We have a gestation period of three, four years. And then we're about to set up a factory that's going to, that has the capacity to produce about maybe 5,000 liters of palm oil in an hour. So we're in the hmm. process of, of getting those that work is, done. So that is phenomenal. That is so those, whether we those like are my priorities. <laughs> we are going to get to that place whether we like it or not. We're <laughs> yeah. going to be beginning to get there because when we can't even you know the logistics of importing and exporting right now based on what is going on. So at some point in time, we have to begin to look inwards. And we, that's we we're right on track with that. As a country, right we must we must, that. yeah, yeah. What, what what would you call a bad product? Is there anything that you've ever gotten as a brief and said, this is this is a bad one. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Well, the, the, to be honest, you can sell the, the, the worst of products can still be sold. But I have, I have like maybe moral lines that I'm not going to cross. There was one time mm -hmm. that some guy told me, oh, I mean, this uh, body cream uh, business, I uh, asked Steve, you know, it's you that I want you to come and help me sell this thing. And I'm like, yeah, this is fantastic. I took one of my brand managers and we went to the meeting with the gentleman and we got there and they started bringing out. It was some whitening cream, skin whitening. I'm like, I, I looked at my no. brand manager and she, and she got the message. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Black is beautiful. I'm not going to ever put my name behind selling the product that will tell a black man to bleach their skin. I think that is where I just draw the line. If not, yeah. I mean, once, once it's, the product is legal and it's not harmful to, for human consumption or for human usage, yeah. I mean, you can find a way around this to tell a compelling story to sell them. Mm -hmm. What is your dream for Nigeria? I know that you're very good friends with um, Alibaba. I know that... He's, he's, uh, he's, he's, our, he's our boy in the industry, yes. I have respect yes, for him yes. a lot. Yeah. And I also know that um, his capacity is widening even up to the federal level, sure, uh, sitting sure. on the board of committee. Yeah. Um, what would you like to see and how do you think you'd like to play uh, in the space of um, entertainment, tourism and culture uh, for us to be able to explore and, explore and export our content outside of the world? Outside of the world. Well, already... If you look at what has happened to the creative space in Nigeria, it, it's been phenomenal. I, I, I was in Cannes some times ago and I was passing by just a normal ice cream shop in, uh, in Cannes in summer. We went for the Cannes Lion Festival. And this, this shop was run by this elderly white, white man. And mm -hmm. blasting out of the speakers in, of, the, of the sound system in his, in his shop was a music by techno. How many times have I gone through airports where they are playing Ashas music 
or they are playing David or playing whis- whiskey. Nigeria's music has actually is beginning to appear Daniel. the way those those American movies used to be back in the days where they just became the dominant and hegemonic culture in cinema. I think that's where we're going to now. But yes. you know what's interesting about all of that thing, those things that have happened? Not one naira of government money is in music. That's it. It is, it is by private individuals. Shout out to the Kenny Ogunbe's of this one, of this world, to the Audu Mekoris of this world, to uh, Obi Asikas of this world, and even to a young generation of David Doe, Whiskey, and Olamide. These are the guys... Mm-hmm who put their own money where their mouth is and they have built this behemoth of a business empire that the whole world is now applauding for. So I, I think what I want to see more is to see how the government can empower the next generation. Look at the unemployment rates among, among the youth population. We, 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 we probably are one of the youngest countries in the world, you know, yes. where people, the, the bulk of our population are under 30, right? So look at the unemployment rate. In serious double digits, that's what we experience yeah. at unemployment. That for every David do you create, every whiskey you create, you are probably creating a job for about 50 other people. They are designers, mm. they are hairstylists, they are barbers. And that's why you see that even the, 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 the security guard for David do has now become an internet sensation in the past mm. during, during this lockdown. Shout out to Father DMW. But... It, 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 it's how these things should evolve, and that's why the government needs to pay attention. And nobody is even telling government to bring money and contribute. We people have built this industry without government. What people yes. are saying is that government should enable those laws that will make it difficult for somebody to just take a piece of intellectual property and use them without compensation. And I think it's about just being able to empower that next generation to thrive yes. and fly within that creative industry. And that's what I would like to see happen into the future. What, what, what do you think is holding back? Because the music, obviously, the music industry is obviously involved and revolutionized. What's mm-hmm. holding back for the theater, for the movie industry? Well, again, if you look at it, the movie industry, as beautiful as our story is from here to America, to Europe, and even to the Caribbeans. I mean, I know some of our actors who will go to a small African country and shut down traffic by just walking on the streets. Yes. It's, 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 huge, it's a huge empire, but look at what is the infrastructure that will allow this kind of business to thrive is what is missing. And that is the area government can actually put uh, the, 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 the people who have the money versus the people who have the skills. How many cinemas do we have in Nigeria? If you release the movie, if you release your movie in America because of the Large number of cinema you can recoup in one month. You've almost recouped off all of. You can be in the cinema for one year if they allow you, and you still have not even recouped your money because the oh, cinema yeah. space is limited. You know what I mean? So it's about infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. If you, if the government is borrowing money left, right, and center, I can't even blame the government because as a businessman, I understand that you need debt to sometimes to be able to finance your dreams. But yes. let's not borrow money to pay salaries. Let's borrow money to build infrastructure. And we need government to like, like look into it and build all of the necessary infrastructure for, for businesses like the movie so to try. So these are the things that you would ordinarily want to share and also be part of in the process that people like Ali Baba and his team are trying to sure. put together. Sure, sure, sure. I actually, was, I actually had a meeting with the Honorable Minister for Information, uh, Alajilai Mohamed, I think in March mm-hmm. before... Uh, before the lockdown, uh, yeah, I think fourth of March, if I'm, if I'm, if I remember correctly, and those are part of the things that I discussed with him as frankly as possible to say, look, uh, we need him to just look at uh, an Apcon, for instance. Apcon is the regulatory body for advertising. for For the yeah. past four years, going on five years, there has been no council government that set up the council, dissolved the council, and has refused to re- re- reconstitute it. We need all of those things to happen so that. Those are the necessary framework that will allow the creative industry to, to thrive and survive into the mm-hmm. future. Yeah. I have to thank you so much, Mr. Baba. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you. Time. I hope that um, we're going to have an opportunity to get what it is that you're working on, your projects, so that we yes, can sir. also throw it out on this platform for people who want to use or refer or, you know, build themselves. It's one of our, uh, our objectives for, for this space. So thank you for yes. making the time out. Thank you thank for you. being there. I shout out to all of my clients that have been supporting us, clients like yes. Blue, Vacom, like DSTV, 
Shout out to all of my clients and Pick Milk and all of those <laughs> clients that we do business with. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the questions that have poured in. Um, at at Pretosh J Network, uh, we appreciate you for being there. Hey, Demi Lade, uh, Lady Rio. Thank you so much for all of you who have joined uh, in this Shout out to Lady Rio too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Thank Superman. you so much, Mom. I will be, have a lovely, have, have I'll a lovely doing a, a, confession, um, a summary of all of this. Uh, and oh. uh, it would also be available on IG Live for people who want to have a repeat uh, and listen to it. Uh, how do we support Team for Presidency? J Giant please, Network. Please, please just keep sharing it on Instagram. Keep sharing, sharing. Yeah. And, and give me your endorsements. Yeah, I will appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. I'm going to be doing that on all of my platforms. Uh, Thank you, you so know, much. Definitely need somebody who is forward thinking, who is vibrant, and also understands the nuance and the idiosyncrasies of the young ones. So, definitely, bye bye, call for president. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs> you Have too. a good week and stay safe. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much everybody uh for joining in we had so much fun it's been a great week it's been a great weekend wish you all the best for the week please stay safe stay as compliant uh covid19 compliant as possible we'll meet you again next weekend for another session goodbye and god bless